Ah ja. Eu. Curando. Listen. Engage. Kasafti. Henry Fioli. Represent. Guys, it's seven o'clock. I think we'll make make a start. So, welcome to the first of two Welsh Athletics Endurance Performance webinars. Uh, my name's uh, Liz Davis, and I lead on the Endurance uh, Pathway Development for Welsh Athletics. Um, tonight, we've got the pleasure of being joined by one of our own, Mr. Chris Jones, um, who's going to be guiding you guys through uh, transitioning athletes from club to international level. Chris will talk a little bit about his background in his presentation, but as a bit of an overview, Chris is our current national coach. Um, he's coached at the highest level in both uh, triathlon and athletics. Um, has coached world champions, European champions in those sports. Um, Chris has also um, led endurance programs both in the UK and overseas. So brings a wealth of experience for you guys to listen to this evening. Um, so before we start, just an overview of the session. We're going to split the session into two parts. So the first part of the session, Chris will talk about some of the fundamentals of transition athletes from club to international level. And then the second part, we'll talk a little bit more about training, design and prescription. So we'll have um, a, a questions and answer after the first part and also at the end. So if you've got any questions for Chris, don't leave them all to the end. You can start putting them in as you go along. That will mean that we can answer as many questions as possible. So, without further ado, I will hand you over to Chris, and I hope you all enjoy your evening. At the moment, Liz, I've got both of us on screen. I'm still um, on screen. If you, so press, I need to... if you press your um, onto the, the presentation, it'll take us to the background. Thanks. Brilliant. Uh, well, evening, everybody, and I uh, hope there's not too much of a delay. Um, I'm in quite a rural area and so sometimes the internet might not be quite as fast but I hope um, this evening things are going to pace. Um, first of all a little bit of background and intro as Liz um, said my, my initial background was working in triathlon and a multi-sport and um, my first position was head coach at Bath with the British triathlon and I think I, I referenced that a lot because I think it gave me an insight into understanding the complexity of different challenges across different disciplines of swim, bike, run, but it also made me look at the detail. Um, but again, it was a very control program, a centralized program. So you had a lot of control of what you were doing as far as resource and work with athletes going. I then went on to do some consultancy after that project from Belgium, Slovakia. And then I rolled into Ireland where I, I worked then as a director and as a technical director, again, building a program in Ireland. And then eventually <clears throat> I came across the, the, the sport of athletics, um, head of endurance. And that's where, um, again, it was a really good opportunity because I then got down to the detail of just working with a few athletes, uh, which I enjoyed. Uh, and obviously Fanula Britain was the athlete at the time that I was working with over there and a few other athletes that allowed me again to um, look at the detail and explore sort of a philosophy of actually working with endurance runners and athletes now obviously in the current role with Welsh national uh, with, with, as, as a national coach with Welsh athletics um it's, it's a really good opportunity to first of all thank Liz because Liz has built a huge um regional and national development program and the detail of that program I'm pretty confident in a few years time in Wales we'll see a lot of good athletes come through that process so again um 
that's part of the program regional and national development but this evening we're talking about more about the transition of athletes in clubs coming through to seniors so you know that that sometimes sees athletes um you know sat around you know how long has the athlete been training how long has the athlete been in the program what's the history and the journey about that athlete um and we see a lot of athletes who are highly motivated in that situation and then there's like a plateauing or they don't sort of reach the potential um and there's questions around lots of things when you start working with those sort of athletes and um, you know what's the training program like what's what's the prescription being like what's the history like the injury history like and and the question there that you know probably a lot of athletes probably don't like to hear is the coachability and the coachability means you know do they have the control to actually run at the right intensities and the pace and actually understand you know when you put a structured program forward it's not always the case that an athlete actually wants to be coached there with that level of detail or control so that's it as coaches who are listening this evening that that's often a challenge that we that we all face um and so what you're trying to do is get a, a relationship where you can build an education with you and the athlete to actually understand how you want to build the program, why it's important to train at the right intensities and develop the right systems. And then off the back of that, then you're always looking to review and refine things that's going to ho hopefully lead to um, a better performance. I think there's a slight delay on this. So I'm just holding fire while the slides turn over. I think all of us as coaches, one of the challenges that we, we have is how to coach what's in front of us. And coaching what's in front of us is key. And I, I found many, many years ago that I clearly got to understand that I had a certain number of athletes that I could probably work with at a, at a level of detail. Um, and I think that's something to consider as coaches when you say coaching what's in front of you is key, how that is managed within a framework of different disciplines, different athletes, different environments, and obviously the scale of the group as well that, that brings to the, the challenge of coaching. So I think, you know, for me, it's really important that you understand how you're going to manage that. Sometimes it's not easy. Chris, the Wi-Fi was a little bit sketchy then, um, so we just missed that last little bit. Oh, so, I'm sorry, the Wi-Fi is not so good. Um, all I was highlighting there is that it's really important that we do get control and um, understand what we can coach in front of us. And when you're working with bigger groups, I think the challenge there is how do you get the detail in and make sure that the individual athletes getting what they need. So let's just look at athletes history and journey from, you know, where is it that most of us as coaches, when an athlete comes along and asks for help or support, there's usually history behind that stage when you're transferring some around either a senior athlete later on in the career or coming through that back end of a junior under 23 into the senior rank. So we look at consistency of training. There's some history around injuries. Is that related or linked to the physical preparation and the, and the, and the history there? Is the techni technical model good and how do your athlete move at that stage when you first meet them? You know, usually when I meet athletes and they want to come across or they want to start working with you, they're already a prolific trainer. There's, there's no doubt about it. They can train hard enough, they can do the volume. Um, and again, performances, are, uh, they're not consistent, they're erratic and sometimes over raced. So these are the sort of things that are coming into the discussion uh, of, of where you want to go to try and develop that first stages of that relationship. Um, and obviously there's, there's the emotional control element to training that you want to explore. And then, you know, it's looking at the event specific requirements aligned to the training program. So what I'm trying to get to there is that I've never asked to coach anybody in 25 years. And I believe there's a, uh, there's, there's a responsibility here where, you know, you, 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 you are trying to help somebody, but there's also a buy-in from the, the athlete 
as well as it's trying to work with you and it's trying to establish how that working relationship is sometimes it takes an education sometimes it takes time to just develop an understanding of actually what is it that works for the athlete and um, athletes are highly motivated athletes want to push themselves hard and sometimes hard just for the sake of it is not good and it's not where you want to go um, and you don't want to dampen that enthusiasm you don't want that to take that away from an athlete but at the same time you just want to refine that understanding to say the reason why you are doing this is because and it's it's having that evidence-based conversation all the time that leads you into developing what i believe is a better understanding of why you're writing a program and and how you're going to try and get the best out of out of your athlete There are areas where you know you can start from and, and in all exchange or handover from an athlete and a coach, we all want to do those things as best as we can. And we all want to support the good work that's previously been done by the previous coaches. All coaches add value to that part of that athlete's journey. So that mustn't be dismissed. And what I would come to is that, you know, when you come to a point where you're trying to move an athlete through the ranks from being a good club to representing your home nation to representing Great Britain, then there's a level of detail that probably needs to be brought in now. And so what I consider now is what you can see in front of you is just some basic profiling tools that we would use. And usually athletes first would go through the lab sort of area and you try to get a good lab test and understand what the profile is. Um, and then on the other side of it, as you develop an athlete, you start looking at the different elements of strength and condition, the nutritional, the blood profiling, the, the, the physio type, uh, functional control and alignment and things. Uh, and, and, and then obviously you start to build a program and obviously then design and build a level of resource and support that's needed to support the athlete's profile. Off the back of that, I'm sure everybody and a lot of people have seen these sort of models. It's whether you work on a four, five or six zone model, but it's been clear about what it is that you're trying to do. And I think often the case is we, we, we roll out training programs and again, in bigger groups, the control there is very, very difficult. If you've got highly motivated individuals, which most endurance athletes are, they will crash through some of these zones and just run them a little bit too quick. And at times it takes time to pull people down and put them in the right place for the training intensity. Because we can all write a lot of training and we can all write train, training sessions, but it's understanding exactly what you're trying to do in the specific areas of the program that will, the athlete will adapt to. Often the case is that if, if um, an athlete is what I say often refer to spending too much time in the grey zone where they're not running easy enough to get the road back adaptation and they're not able to run fast enough to push things up they spend a lot of time in this steady area zone three and you're just not going to get the responses or the adaptation so there, there is a there, there is a, um you know a requirement for the for the athlete to buy into that i think and uh, for me for one you know that is the detail and um that's why as i said earlier in the presentation that i just don't feel comfortable when i be doing the bigger groups when i wouldn't have that type of control i think in the bigger groups that are better at, you can have them training together there's no doubt about that but usually you've got an understanding of that's enough for you or you need to back off or don't push too far so you need good communication in those groups when you've got better athletes training together just bringing things into um more of a structure you know you're going to profile someone and then Profiling is one thing, and you know I wouldn't say you know I'm a big fan of using the lab much at all, really. I think over the years, you know, I've become much more comfortable in monitoring, as I call it, snapshotting in training sessions, just to see what's going on and how the athletes responded to those sessions, and that becomes the tool where an athlete actually really gets to understand what they are doing and what they own, and they're coming to say it's X. They understand what's the right intensity, and then. If you look at number three, they will talk a lot about this, this later, is the aerobic and anaerobic balance. And athletes are different. They're incredibly different. Some athletes just need a sprinkling of intensity and they're ready to go. Some athletes need can take and absorb a lot more intensity and 
yeah, they, they don't they don't um, develop as much anaerobic strong profile. Um, so you this big aerobic engine, they can do that type of work. But you've got when you've got athletes who are powerful or sensitive and they're mixed in that type of work, doing it with other people, they're the people that risk them when you're actually trying to control things because they're all running and pushing hard, but they're a little bit sensitive to that work. So it's how do you know as a coach, how do you know what is the right dose, should we say, of that type of work that would um, allow that athlete to not get overcooked, should we say. Performance indicators, that's just a standard of looking at actually um, where is your athlete at? What is the cost at a given velocity? So if you want to run a 5K, to, for example, mail in 15 minutes, and it's three minutes a K, what is the cost? That is the performance indicator. That's the honesty box. And that's the box I think that we don't go enough into and we don't look at. But I think, you know, particularly when you're working with athletes who've got sensitive profiles and things move quickly, you need to be in that space a lot. And you need to be monitoring that space particularly building into major races because what we tend to see is that the great aerobic work and the work that they've done earlier on really gives you an indication as a coach that they're really in really good form however a little bit too much of that intensity and you're on the start line and you get a different outcome and then it's back to the drawing board why what's happened where if you can track that type of intensity you can money uh, in that middle distance area it's an element that you want to know a lot about um if you're looking at the longer distance athletes it's, it's an element of like looking at neural fatigue it's an element of looking at power output and it's a good marker actually also to tell you where your athlete's fatigue is as well so um we tend to use that and more looking at that when we're profiling our younger athletes for where the event profile is going forward so look at this of like how do you manage it how do you model it and i'm not sure this will be working all of this and they'll be they'll be using these type of uh looking at profiling they're looking at training sessions monitoring because they're either working with professional athletes or athletes in good teams or they're actually uh, they've got their own one-to-one -one, um sort of situation and support around the combination hubs and things um for me, the number three, when you start rolling into major championships or major goals, particularly with a few athletes, you need to know who those athletes are and you need to know exactly how you're going to actually just track that profile. And I'll keep coming back to that because that's usually the point of breakdown. And usually I see examples of really great training around that aerobic endurance. And the aerobic endurance is set at a certain velocity and the athlete's motivation is running it fractionally too quick. And sometimes that mixed in with also getting excited in this pace of their aerobic development can cause that profile to shift across quite quickly. And believe you me, it can happen incredibly quickly with certain athletes. So that, that will be a theme that's going through this all the way because these athletes usually have come from um, uh, programs which have had quite a lot of intensity they've over raced they've not been consistent and they've plateaued a long period of time and that's not all cases but in some cases if that is the case then you've got to ask the question why or if you're seeing athletes who are training really well but yet are not consistent with the performances you've got to go back and ask yourself what why what is it that's actually causing this and usually it would just be a simple thing of actually that the intensity in the program is too high and it's not being monitored and things that we describe as threshold or tempo are being run too fast. So the anaerobic system is just growing too strong and too dominant as we, as we move through. Coming back then to support that, because we're just discussing profiling in this first part, um, is you know the uh, strength and conditioning program is key. Um, it helps the technical movement, improves um, tendon health and ligament health, structural muscle mass, better movement and control physiological improved efficiency and improved fatigue resistance, force improved contact, stiffness activity, increase your power per stride. Strength independence above four pillars ultimately drives the performance. So a couple of things first on that. The majority of that work was done by Andy Walling, BA Physio, and helped us look at actually how we'd actually put that type of program together in Wales. Uh, the person who's delivering that now is Finn Cochran uh, from a multi-event background. And I say that because 
you've got a really good interlinking. They both think the same. And I hope I'm not going to offend any strength and conditioning coaches out there, but it's hard to find strength and conditioning coaches from a, an athletic background. And someone might just dismiss me and say, that's not important. But actually, it's really important and it's really relevant because there's a skill, there's a learning process, a skill acquisition, a skill learning process that's critical to actually when you're working with particularly endurance athletes and it gets lost. It actually gets lost. So we we are saying we're making people stronger, but what are we actually changing? And you know what are we actually impacting on? Some of the work that we looked at recently, uh, particularly with athletes, is that when you've got an athlete who's a senior athlete, it's a high risk strategy when you start coming in to try and change all the technical attributes of that athlete who's been running like that for probably 10, 15 years. There are elements where you can make it stronger. And if they don't get injured and they're not breaking down, then you have to have a good reason why you're going to go about and start changing technical, uh, making technical changes. And I'm talking a big technical change, not just small technical change. We can only improve the contact time on the ground. We can only improve the the, the return from the floor of where the heel comes up, and we can we can return the 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 um, the, 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 the skill of movement and 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 um, go through like um, drills and hurdle drills and things that actually obviously improve the, the technical running movement. But I'm talking about trying to change things that have been ingrained there for a long time. I'd just be aware that, um, you know, if you've got someone as a hill striker, for example, he's been that for 15 years and, you know, he's trying to be a 215 marathon runner and you're trying to bring him onto the four foot, there's a risk attached to that. <clears throat> and I wouldn't underestimate that. It's the same as some people also on track, you know, you're trying to improve that side of things. So I would be aware of that and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions about that. I think you know we all want to see the hit of the ground under the central mass. We all want to see a strong round the core area. We all want to see good strong hamstrings and a nice elastic return. But again, we're all made a certain way. So there are only certain elements that we can do, and there's only certain so much return we'll get from that as well. So there, there is a, there is a balance between what you're trying to do, particularly all the senior athletes that you've just taken on and trying to transfer through this process. I think that's specific, and I think that's what Finn and Andy have got really right and an understanding <clears throat> around what is athletic movement and how you have that skill development. Um, and, 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 and I think it has to also add into the program when you've got athletes running 80, 90 miles a week, there's an amount of fatigue. So keeping a balance of two sessions a week with drills and skills and power and strength development, there's a balance. So there's an understanding how you integrate this, this as one. So I think that brings us to the end of the, the first part, of just discussing the history of, of obviously working with an athlete for the first time, profile an athlete for the first time, how are you going to educate and bring that into control? And then the elements of how you bring the resources from the physio screening into the strength and conditioning, and then start adding those ingredients into the first part of the program. Okay, thanks, Chris, for that insightful uh, first part. Um, we have got one question, actually, uh, which has come from Patrick uh, Corcoran, um, and he asks basically what your, your take is on uh, race tactics, because um, he feels that often um, athletes may, may sometimes get that wrong going into races and maybe need to work on that. What's your, what's your thoughts on that, Chris? So the, the initial part of that missile is my audio sort of dropped for a second. So you talk <laughs> about race tactics. Yeah, what what your what sort of what's your take on race tactics and kind of your emphasis in I suppose in in training? Because um, Patrick feels it's maybe an area that's often neglected um, by by coaches. I, I think it's a really good area that needs developing. Um, I think you know we condition athletes. We put athletes into in measured pace races, which is a big trend with the BMC, and it allows us to run fast. Uh, it does not teach us to drop speed or uh, at certain elements of races. It doesn't teach us to take ownership of tactics. And I think, you know, by developing some of those things within your club framework, within your group framework, is a really good practice. But I also think it's a really good practice to race as well, an equal proportion or more so of races that are not just pace races. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Uh. Trying to get Lewis Walker's asked a question about um lactate testing. Uh, and I'm trying to work out your question. Sorry, Lewis. But I think you're trying to trying to say, do you track um lactate uh, testing, Chris? I suppose how often would you do it, and 
you know, how do you track that in your programmes? Uh, it's a good question. We'll, there'll be a little bit more as we go through the presentation. And, um, you know, we, we would monitor in certain phases of training, particularly to establish sometimes what we're looking at as far as the aerobic endurance sort of development of an athlete is. We track that um, quite regularly. COVID has been honest, has restricted that over the last 12 months. But prior to this COVID period, we'd have done a lot of tracking and Dan Nash would have been down, particularly working with the, the girls group that I work with. And there'd be constant tracking of actually what we're looking at on the values, particularly when we're developing that um, aerobic endurance. In the previous sort of um, organizers I've worked with also, I would also track, um, you know, as, as, a, as the intensity comes into the program, I don't want, uh, I'm going to discuss this later, but we would also track sort of snapshots of the warm up just to see what it's costing athletes at an intensity prior to sort of key workouts. So what you're trying to look at there is as the aerobic intensity as, as, as it grown, as the anaerobic contribution grown too much, meaning that the aerobic capacity started to shrink because you brought this level of intensity. And so that's one of the key sort of discussion points tonight to say, how do you manage that around your athletes and groups that you're working with? So yeah, we would track that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, last question, and um, so Chris can move on um, uh, from from Pete Pete Ryder. Um, just um, asking what your thoughts are on the ideal size of a group. I mean, I know you've touched upon this, Chris, but um, and what what level of what? Uh, how many numbers would you think is the right number to get the right level of detail? I think it depends where you are in your training. In some groups, you, you know, the general sort of work. You know, obviously, you can have a, a bigger group training together. I think on specific work when you're working, you know, your ratio really probably is around maximum six to eight, really, if you are trying to monitor things or control certain things. But if you've got eight guys with a very similar profile, then obviously it's easier. If, if you are then looking at mixing in huge groups, then you, as a coach, you, you have to be honest that you in that group, you know that there'll be elements that you can control for some of them, but not for others. Or you have to have really good management of actually really be clear to what you're trying to do with those groups in different standards internally inside a big group of exactly what the pace that they should be running at. And that takes control. And, and you know, I went to um, a session by Rob McKim down in Reading when I was doing the mentoring program, and he had a fantastic example of actually how he did that. So he he's he's guys were doing this session and all these young kids turned up and they were really good 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 group of young athletes and he put like a um a, a yellow vest on this guy at the front and then he was holding the pace and no one was allowed past this youngster and i thought it was just a great example of simply how you can control things and make it more productive by just not letting everybody scream down the road and i'm sure on the track environment you can do those you know you can control that and you've got whistles and pace and things but when you when you're running bigger sessions around grass grass environments or you know trails and things it's sometimes a little bit harder to to do that so and i think the higher the level you go and the more should we say detail needed around the profile then you the coach can be coaching the session but he needs, he needs assistant coaches or people there like his physiologists and things to be to be monitoring so it's easy to say then someone's got the the the, the um the authority to say you need to back off slow down you need to do this so you know there's a, there's a big difference between working a group there and then working a young group of athletes down at cardiff harris so you've got to take into consideration of one the numbers and enjoyment and that side of things versus the detail that's needed in a, in a bigger group i think a challenge and i think we, i've touched on this with a few of the coaches you know i know steve vernon's a, you know a good friend of mine and we discuss a lot about the ratio and the detail of how that works and then we also you know um jmc is you know, again a great friend of mine and he does it brilliantly in the sense of actually how he looks at the top end of the group and then he has steve mitchell and they manage it across there and i know luke does a similar job in in birmingham but the big challenge is there's no about that those coaches so it takes a lot of management and a lot of control but you know they're doing great jobs and producing good athletes but at the top end of that program it would probably be easy to miss a little bit of detail around some of the profiles so i think that's where they're going to need more resources support around that to just make sure that those guys are not pushing too hard okay yeah uh, thanks chris um we'll uh, leave the questions for the first part there and i'll let chris uh, crack on with the next part of this presentation Okay, I think 
you know, just let me. So give you a second. I think just leading on to you know um, athletes who have come through that process really, and you can see here from 2017 to 20 steps of improvement through the through the different events, and um, you know Clara um, is an athlete actually that um, you know has really really taken on board a lot of the you know the the detail and the advice. And what's really interesting about Clara is that she she has um, very little. Uh, history of injury and and can take on a lot of work but also is really happy to to run in the right zones run easy um and then um obviously run at the intensity um that's required but i would say and i'm not sure she's on the call tonight but what i would say also is that as an athlete you, you go through that and it's, it's not all plain sailing at times there's been days when they just don't go your way because you're too tired or you know, she has a busy job, she's balancing work around training as well. So to sort of get to these standards and then represent Great Britain at a world championship, it's, it's a, you know, it, it, it's, it's fantastic. And it's, it's a huge step forward. And recently, 32.47 on a cold track in Newport, again, is a really big step forward. So it shows that, you know, we're seeing more power development, more speed endurance development and a better balance to the training. The marathon at the moment is a little bit unknown. And that's what we're preparing for at the moment. And obviously, we'll see and look forward to, to uh, you know, obviously uh, that competition in Kew Gardens in a few weeks' time. So all I'm trying to show here is that there's clear steps of improvement. And the improvements are really built around what I've just been talking about, understanding of a profile, getting the training intensity right, being consistent in your training, consistent in your training. And also, you know, having, having a balance also with your lifestyle and, and, and that really comes out really strongly in, in, in Clara as, as a young athlete, that she's got a really good balance and support system at home with Paul and it just, it just works for them. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really nice to see a, an athlete go through that process. Um, and then it comes on to this, the pro design and philosophy and coaches here will have read and you all have different words for it, where it's your general phase or your aerobic one. Um, but really what we're trying to do in the initial phases is develop the aerobic system and technique comes into that side as well. If you can add technique and drills and hurdles and all that and make that a bit of a priority in the first pro pro preparatory phase, it's a good place to start. And then aerobic capacity, power short hills, get some stiffness, get you know improve that sort of power output with the technique in the early stages of the program design. Moving on then to more aerobic capacity and strength. And looking at longer hills, are those hills one minute? So are they two? Are they three sets of two minutes and two one minutes? That's what you've got to work out with your athlete. Is it on a trail? Is it on a good surface? Is your athlete not respond well when it's on a soft surface, or do you need your athlete to run a hill that's a firm surface so you get more return from the ground? But that's an area of looking at when you develop aerobic capacity plus strength and longer hills. Then we come into aerobic power, sort of VO2, and we're looking at sessions there that's pushing the peak power up as high as we can aerobically. And we've built a system then that allows us then to start doing event-specific endurance. And that endurance then needs to be carefully managed around what the event specifics are that you're trying to do with resistance, short recoveries, and a bit of power that allows you then to compete. So that would be my interpretation of a philosophy that I think I understand and believe in. And then what I try to do with that is actually try to fit that um, alongside the athlete that I'm working with. Um, and some athletes are working with a more powerful than others. Some athletes have got a better metabolic, the more aerobically than others, or they respond better to that type of work. Not everybody's the same. So you go through those phases, but you have different elements or a different, as I say, spice to each area um, for each individual athlete. And that's the key, really. They can't all be doing the same things all the time. The critical areas of program design, and this is something that um, we can't stick to this type of loading, but in principle, what you're trying to do is have a loading system um, and cycles of training that will, the, the most important thing for everybody who's on this call right now and every coach that's on this call is trying to keep your athlete healthy. That's the most important thing. You're always on it, on, we say, um, 
there's a high risk when you're working with athletes that are in endurance events and they're trying to do well at 5, 10, the marathon. There's always a risk attached to it. Every coach that's successful on this call will always be balancing that in every day that they're working with their athletes. And so in if I'm looking at the general sort of or the preparatory and general phase of the training, I try to come with this principle. I used to go high, high, low and high, high, low. And but for, I always get pulled back to this model. And it's a model that I used in triathlon because I believe that I could control all the elements much more. But if I have two weeks of high low, should we say, or it could be 10 days in that two weeks and four weeks, four days down, the low week is a low week that allows me to look at a few things. The very high load would be just a small percentage higher than those first two weeks. And the low week on the end, again, just allows more recovery and regeneration. So if I overlay that one, two, three or four or five times, 25 weeks of conditioning through the winter months, Sometimes I'll move those around for a competition, like a cross country or a road race, that's fine. But what it does also, it allows me to snapshot and look at things or prioritize the session in like week three or five that we're really getting a feel that you, you should be handling that session well. You should be able to you know, produce a good quality uh, session uh, at that week three or five. It also allows, if we're in non-COVID, we can also do much more monitoring in those weeks three and five because the athlete's got is, is a little bit more recovered and the quality of the sessions or the test sessions or the performance indicators as we say um a better a better position because the athlete's not as fatigued but i think the key really is health absolutely from the, from what you're trying to do with your athlete is to keep them healthy all the time and so you know think about how you do the loading we can all put a lot of high mileage out there and people can write programs, but the only thing that will constantly keep people going forward is consistency and staying healthy. And so I think that's why you probably need to consider how it is that you design your cycles of training. The example of a training load in a preparatory phase, and the aim is obviously to improve the aerobic capacity the VO2 session or hills for strength to be talked about. And initially in this phase, we stay away from the threshold work or middle ground work only for depending. It could be only as little as five weeks, eight or 10 weeks. But we try to just, if you can imagine, push the pyramid as high as we can with the VO2 and strength versus build this big base and aerobic system underneath things. And that's just an example, really of the type of work that we do in that phase. Um, I could give you probably three or four examples, but that's the content and the ingredients of, of just the general phase, that preparative phase. So in the fundamental or conditioning general phase now, you know, we're starting to increase aerobic capacity and power. So the volume is important to go up, strength, 10K conditioning sessions and controlled threshold development sessions. The one thing here is that shouts out at you straight away as well, 10K pace and threshold type work is quite close together. And this is the bit that needs to be really controlled. Um, if you if you just look at this glancing through, you might have sessions here that, um, that if you look at the Friday in this session here, you can clearly see there's a build, three might be just three mile and that build might come up to where the high turn point is. You might have a mile that's easy and then you might have three times one mile uh, threshold. That's the easiest thing in the world to describe to coaches and athletes out here, but it's not the easiest thing in the world to control. And nine out of 10, those three times one mile will start going quicker because I'm feeling good and we start pushing on, which now becomes something different. Um, and then the other sort of sessions that we're working around um, would be 10K pace or just slightly faster, fractionally faster sometimes. And again, it's supported again by a following session that following Friday. And again, you can see the pace is 10K threshold, 10K, 3K, that sort of stuff. Um, and, it, and again, the message what I'm trying to say to you here is you're not really seeing that much intensity. You're seeing more control um, in these general building phases. In the spe spe specific preparation phase, um, Again, aerobic development continues, increased recovery around key sessions because you want to hit them, and the extension principle. And this is what you need to ask yourself. Do you want to go faster or do you want to go further? Um, and how are you going to develop that specific event endurance? 
So you, know, you can see now in Tuesday session, like three eight hundreds, you know, a specific event preparation sort of space for what that ever is, and it needs to be carefully managed. So if if, if you're starting to ask your athletes to to run at certain speeds over longer longer intervals, shall we say? Um, one, you, you need to get the pace right, and two, you need to allow the recovery process around it uh, to be right as well. So there's an extension principle. Sometimes you don't need to be, also if you come to Friday there, which is a classic Vernon session, Vernon session actually, um, I'm sure you mind me putting that in, but you know, four, four hundreds at like 3k pace, four mile tempo, four, four, four hundreds, you could descend at the end of that. And that, those type of sessions, people look at them and think, you know, why are they there? The there is just a, a, um, um, a stimulus. You don't need to be going too far in too soon. You, you know, you want to look after the aerobic system. You want to look after the event specific speed at the right cost, and you want to grow that through the season. And what we tend to see is that people tend to go a little bit too hard too soon, and the season lasts too long. So then they have to reset and go back and do more conditioning work. So you're trying to grow your event specific preparation. And again, that should be a short window, and then you go back, do some general work, and then come back up again and do sort of event-specific type work. But I, I, again, I must stress that this type of program, what you're looking at, is for someone running either a 5,000 or a 10,000, or possibly on the roads. Okay. Just touching on, again, this transfer of where you go with athletes. Again, um, people obviously come through that environment and start improving at tens and halves and things and want to go to the marathon. And it's really important that you do um, exhaust your potential or you, you, at 10K, it's important that you do uh, run a good half marathon or reach your potential in those areas before suddenly just turning your, your attentions to the marathon and things. Um, and again, before you start any of these specific phases, as, as um, you know, I would expect an athlete to be in very, very good 10K shape. I would expect a high lactic turn point, strong aerobic endurance prior to start in marathon preparation. And then um, the marathon preparation phase, and it's subject to its ability to absorb a training load and volume. And then critically, the fueling profile is critical to any success at the marathon. And you've got athletes who are, you know, are fat burning animals, you've got athletes who are high sugar burners, and, and it's actually getting the balance right and understanding exactly, um, one, what type of training suits them, and two, the, 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 the fueling process that will need to, to, to run a good, good marathon. And um, let's just show you. <clears throat> So this, this event specific planning here was planned out uh, prior to COVID. So it is just an example from March coming through this, some cycles there, some, some time trials, this recovery before this another cycle that's a 10K preparation phase. And you can see the loading and, and some volume around the bottom of that. And I'm not saying, obviously this is for an individual, it's not for everybody designed like this, but what I'm actually trying to show you that the preparatory phases that lead to where you need to start. And off the back of that, you're changing your fueling process when you want to run a good marathon. And then it's a question of how long you can stay in that event specific marathon block. Some people can do a longer block, the more robust, the, the more of a fat burning type athlete, uh, a diesel type, big engine, strong athlete, they could do a longer phase than that. Other athletes might not. And usually what you tend to see in those cycles of marathon preparation is that halfway through, the athlete starts to get fatigued and doesn't start recovering. They start to lose a lot of pop in the cadence. They start to look just generally tired all the time. And even when you're on the taper, you, you just tend to get a fatigue type marathon. And, and usually it's because they, they, they're not, it's probably not quite strong enough this sometimes. Um, but again, it's just, it's generally down to uh, the not that type of athlete. Um, the, 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 I think Rob Hawkins in his presentation, twice you've either got like the Porsche, like, um, 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 how do you describe it? You've got the diesel type athlete who can grind out all the work and you've got the track refined athlete who needs a delicate sort of approach to actually how you, build into that marathon. And I do think that's quite clear that you can see the very two different type of athletes uh, who can and who can't do that type of work. Uh, 
And again, here we, here we just literally just showing um, a, a short phase of event specific marathon phase. Um, you can clearly see that there's some, still the rhythm and the 10K work around which certain athletes need and build the big days. And then on the Friday there, you can see five to six, four Ks at marathon pace. Um, again, just giving more recovery and aerobic running in between things. And finally, that last Saturday, you can see 21 miles of running, but that's building around marathon, building and maybe fractionally above or around marathon. So it's how you design that. It's how you work with your individual athletes to, to, to come through that phase. Um, initially, when you're transferring, we're talking about what the presentation is about transferring an athlete and club athlete up to um, an elite athlete or being able to, to, which a lot of female athletes do very well, actually, and particularly at the marathon. Um, you know, Nick Anson does a great job with athletes in that space. Um, and, it, and it seemed to be done well across the country. But the one thing I would say is that it's, it's keeping your athlete healthy. Everything about this is staying in one piece, it's keeping healthy. I think moving the volumes up and down so you can then do the quality work that's required to do the quality work around those key marathon sessions uh, that's not going to break you down and, uh, and that's the fine balance and that's that's the the um to me that's the, the 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 driving the driver of the design of the program is that if you can get through those cycles of training and you can um, you can get through those key sessions and grow from those sessions and make them progressive you've got the balance right if those sessions are just beating you up and you're just waiting for days to recover it, you probably not a stay away. Obviously, you should be doing that type of load. Okay, so we really come into what I believe is you know how you manage what it is, whether you're preparing for its cross or a 5k, 10k, whatever it is. You're monitoring, you're in pretty capacity. The fractional utilization is just where the high turn point is. Is it high enough? Is the athlete's profile healthy? And then the design is individual. It's an improved uh, specific endurance, lower the cost, higher aerobic velocities, power and technical work are a priority at this point of the preparation. Coming back to the final message, healthy profile. Within optimization, event-specific extension developed at the right intensity. Really take that home. I think that is an absolute key message for everything that... Um, event speed carefully managed, and you're constantly checking the relationship between the aerobic and the anaerobic balance. Managing the balance of aerobic capacity work via the growth of anaerobic interference. So, sorry, I don't sure you heard that. Managing the balance of the aerobic capacity via the growth of the anaerobic interference. I repeated that because there's a delay, I'm sorry. Um, so the event aerobic endurance development, 85 to 93%, it's around that, let's say, that's around your threshold turn point, high turn point versus 93%, roughly around 10K pace. When we come over the other side of the fence here, event specific VO2 plus development is around your 5K velocities coming above and beyond 3K VO2 to 110%, maybe 1500 drop down time sessions. So if you are hitting this area on the right, my right, the, the th five times three fours all the time, and that's sort of the spice of where you're going with your program. You can see that you're operating at a high intensity and that growth of that system is not coming from the aerobic system. So you've got to weigh up how, how much your athlete needs of that type of work versus the strict control and managed control of the event aerobic endurance development. So um, just moving on to this, and you might think, Looking at this here, you might think, what, what's this got to do with anything, actually? Um, but um, a few people will smile and, when they see this, but um, I talk about developing the right balance. And I also talk about, are you adding value or are you taking away? And when you've built up the aerobic system and you're happy where your athlete's training is, and you come into this goal races, or you're trying to hold on to a series of races with particular athletes, the question you've got to ask yourself is, are you adding or are you taking away from performance? So if I just discuss, you might think this is absolute bonkers, this analogy, but it's something that keeps me honest. It's something that makes me think every time I start writing a program. So on the right, you've got a garden hose, a small garden hose. The guy's got his thumb over the end of it. And let's just say he's going to fill that black bin. When that black bin's full of water, it just spills over the top. Um, 
So that's delivering, that's taking up. I rush out and I go get a fire hose, boom, it delivers it, powerful hose, delivers it to that bin a lot quicker, fills it up, spills over the top. So the question is, obviously, the analogy is heart delivering it around the system, draw down oxygen into the bins. And the question to you as coaches in the community, and you know, you have the answer right now, half of you, but how do you get more in the bin? Is your session adding to the bin? In other words, you need bigger bins or you need more bins. So if your session by having too much intensity in that program, if you need, say, um, a percentage of to run a decent 5K, and this, I know this sounds nuts, but if you need seven green bins and three black bins and you've got seven black bins because your intensity is only not allowing those green bins to grow, then that's what you need to ask yourself. You need to ask yourself, am I adding value? Am I growing the ability to take more up? Am I improving the auction uptake at the intensity of race pace to take more up? And if you're not, all you're doing with that power hose is spraying it against the wall, and that's all that's happening. You're not taking anything up. So as an afterthought, if you think about it, when you put pen to paper and you start writing a program, so that's really Chris, something to think Chris, about Chris, Chris sorry we lost you a little bit there I don't know if you could just go over that last um, bit if, if possible only, only the last maybe 10-15 um, seconds um, we just lost you out of uh, yeah yeah okay right. sorry Liz okay can you hear me now Liz, good, can you hear me? Yeah, all good. Thanks, Chris. No, sorry. Okay, thanks. No, no, all the analogy is this, and I think I hopefully this just rounds it off. Is that when you when you are putting pen to paper or you are thinking about designing a program, he's just asking yourself: Am I adding or am I taking away? Am I giving the athlete the the opportunity to draw more down? In other words, bigger bins, or bins. Or am I actually causing so much intensity in the program that they don't have the ability to recruit or draw draw down more? And that's just a simple analogy of actually how you know too much anaerobic, too much intensity will actually break your athlete down. And the, the key is that some athletes can just have, can can grow that sort of diesel, got tons of slow twitch fibers. So you know your Dowie Griffiths has got tons of those, and you won't break him down. But your Charlotte Arter, that type of athlete, you've got to be careful where it sits. You've got to be careful with that. And other athletes like I work with, you've got to be careful. And you're always trying to get them in the right space because those black rings grow so quickly and they'll do sessions that indicate they're going really well. However, when you set the blood out of them, the contribution is too high. So when they then go to a race, there's a lot of disappointment because already they're overdrawn. They cannot do that performance. It's impossible because they're running the 3K, 5K, or trying to run a 10K with the wrong system. Wrong system. And again, just to dwell on that a little bit more, it's quite easy. You can check that. You know, if, if your athletes at these percentages can't achieve these sessions, um, so someone really looking to run a really good 10K at roughly 93% of your 3K projected time, and they can't do that, then there's a reason why they can't do that. The fact is that they're just not conditioned enough properly to do that, and usually the profile will be the wrong way. Um, and so that's, that's what's important to look at, is what, what you're asking people to do. If they can't do 4 1200s at 97 velocity 3K, that's what's required to run a good 5K. That's where they should be or around that. It's easier when you come to the marathon, you should be able to control those pairs. The delicate side of it is more when you come down to the five and the 10. But if you've got too much intensity in there, you just won't be able to do those sessions. The cost will be too high. And so as a coach, 
you know, there's an honesty box there for you as a coach and an athlete to sometimes look at these areas and say, um, this is a check set, this is what we're going to do. And if it doesn't happen, no, it's not happened. I think go back and actually just address that by bringing the training intensity down, increase the aerobic contribution, um, and that 90% that will be the, the major reasons why you won't be able to, to hit those targets. So um, just to summarise, you know, we've talked about histories of athletes and reviewing in athletes that you're taking on, understanding limiting factors to performance talked about the plans and the aims. The plans and the aims, they need to be realistic. They need to be realistic with the athlete you're trying to transfer through that journey. You need to be honest around that. The design then needs to be individual, and then we execute the program. The loading of that execution needs to be important, and it needs to be around the individual needs, and then you can refine it. And you're refining it on evidence-based information, if you can, whether you're just working on heart rates or time or velocity, or you do have the ability to have some lactate and that sort of thing done in, into that space. Once you've looked at that, you'd obviously refine again because that's what it normally takes because you've always this is always evolving and that refinement again allows you to catch things when the intensity has grown too much or um, uh, you know and, and or the athlete needs a little bit more time to adjust to be able to do that type of training. So you're optimizing everything before then hopefully then building into the performance that you've been working working towards. Um, that's me. Um, thank you. Um, I think there's a, the, I hope there's a powerful message there in, in a sense of actually to coaches really, how do we get that level of control? I think that's one thing. How do you understand your individual athletes that, and the type of athlete that you're working with? But then also how are you going to monitor that type of um, work that's required with those athletes? And finally, how do you know sort of the right amount of intensity and, and what will tell you when to pull back? What is it that's going to tell you to slightly pull back? Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, got a, got a few, few questions coming in. Um, one is kind of a little bit around um, sort of athlete, young athlete development and, and kind of what age do you think getting athletes in the lab or getting some profile on them is, is about the right time? I, I think, you know, through maturation and things we talk about, 17, 16 can be with some, but I think 17, 18 years of age, that window there, I think is early enough to start bringing them in. I think more of the things like we talk about um, um, looking at the, 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 the critical speed, I think you know, the peak speed velocity, I think is quite important. I think the functional screen and things like that is really important at that age. Um, I think there's an education around running easy and, and feel and that type of things. Um, but, you know, I'm not sure you need to go too earlier than that into the lab, you know. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, Lewis Walker's asked sessions like five times twelve hundred plus three hundred. What kind of pace are you looking at for um, in the three hundred? So, what kind of pace would you look at in that kind of session? I suppose. Yeah, I, I think it'd just be it'd be a fraction drop down. You know, from the pace if it's five k pace and, and, and broken, it's it's just fractionally fractionally quicker. That's all. Um, it's developing the extension later that that 1200 would be a 15 or it might be a mile. You know, it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be absolutely kicking down. That's not what it is at all. It's just breaking up the length of the interval with a shorter interval on the end. And sometimes also what it's, it's important for is that it's the skill of the mechanics that's important that you've had someone running for a longer interval and a short break and then obviously increasing the, the turnover. And that's a, that's a skill and, and it actually takes... Um, some athletes can't do that, but also when you're building those sets, it's also important to look at the contact time, particularly with, the, with athletes um, in, in, in the, that sort of range of middle distance or the 5K range. You want an athlete also to be able to react and change pace. So some of the, that, some thinking around that would be 1200 to 5K pace, slightly quicker, but not much. You're just looking to, to improve the skill of running on it, really. Okay, hey, thanks, Chris. Um, uh, James Hatton's asked on your performance indicators, um, what sort of um, 
what kind of recovery do you give between um, the efforts and those performance indicators? You mentioned something like five by five, uh, four times twelve hundred, for example. What would be the recoveries on those sort of sessions? Yeah, um, I want to start just initially around two minutes, but bring it back. Um, so you, you know, on 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 the ten k, you'd probably be looking at ninety seconds. Um, you know. Um, on the, on the K, it's different there. You put a K float in at a different pace. That's a different ball game. But on, on the eventually, what you want to try and get as a test set is that four twelve hundreds, and you need it down to around seventy five seconds to ninety seconds. So that would give you a true performance indicator on that twelve hundreds. And on you know on the Ks, uh, sorry on the um, again on the, uh, the the two K reps on the ten K ninety three percent, which is roughly ten K pace. You should be able to handle that well off. Again, 75, 90 seconds recovery. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, the last question we've got um, is from John Rogan, just asking around, um, obviously, the long-term development of our athletes and when do you feel that kind of double-day training is, is, you know, is the, the way to go, really? Um, yeah, I... I... I, th I think again, you know, it needs to be carefully managed and introduced. You know, um, again, later on, 17, 18 years, that sort of area. Uh, people do it earlier. There's no doubt about that. But it's just how you develop those double day training days and what, you know, what the amount is. It isn't a question of just doing uh, high load for the sake of it. You see a lot of examples here of high load. The discussion is transferring a a senior, an athlete through to the senior ranks to try and become an elite athlete so there's a lot of examples there of volume based around and double days but if you're looking at like junior development and under 23 definitely be on double days probably some athletes will be at that stage uh, being a junior um, and also under 23 but again it doesn't mean that every day is double day it probably means maybe a few initially or um, recovery jogs around key sessions those days but it needs to be carefully managed there's no exact figured um, number that just says you've got to do this um, it's just um, what type of athlete you're working with what's the event you're working with and how much stimulus you feel you need around there but I would actually stay away from double days predominantly through a lot of that junior development career um, and I'd do other things actually I think cross training is a good way of going and using other things to develop that aerobic system yeah, I suppose it comes back to stage, not age as well, doesn't it, Chris? Of where people are at yeah. in there, you know, what, what, what history yeah. they've got in sport and such. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. we might have one just question just come in here um, from uh, Bashir uh, Hussein. Um, it says, working the development of speed and balance and development of aerobic conditioning through teenage years and evolving sessions with teenagers. Um, uh, this is a, obviously a challenge for coaches. Um, I maybe focus on 800 this year. Um, sorry, Bashir, I'm trying to get to the what your question is asking here. Um, I suppose it's asking what the development of aerobic and anaerobic is in those kind of younger years as well, and, and which kind of direction to, because obviously you've talked a lot about senior athletes here, Chris, but you know, that kind of ana yeah. anaerobic, yeah. aerobic balance in the younger age groups when you're trying to develop the power, I suppose. No, I think Bashir's right. The fact is that you, you need to get that balance right. And with the younger athletes, that's why you don't need the double days. The fact is that you, you, you want to spend time with you too you want to develop that specific speed and power output uh, and that's critical with it with this with again a, a lower sort of content in that aerobic area the switch comes later um and so he's absolutely right in the fundamental early stages that you know that it should be led by controlled light aerobic development because that's where they're going to get hurt but they need to become stronger they could need to have a better technical model and then the speed sort of area needs to develop that speed endurance strength but that vo2 is what you're trying to develop in those younger athletes so that's a different model and bash is absolutely 100 percent right in that space yeah okay yeah i don't think there's any more questions um uh, come in here chris um but yeah so on that note we'll um we'll probably sort of wrap up the session um, again, thanks, thank you, Chris, for your insights this evening. Really, really good session. Um, lots of food for thought, I think, for for coaches um, and any athletes kind of tuning in. Um, and yeah, thank you, thank you all for coming. Um, just as a heads up, our second um, performance webinar is coming up next week, and that'll be led by um, 
uh, Olympian and is now turned coach Helen Clitheroe. who will be talking a little bit more about the, the kind of female athletes. So, yeah, um, please keep an eye out on social media and in your email box for that. Um, but yeah, um, again, thanks very much, Chris, for this evening and uh, thanks all for tuning in and um, yeah, hope to catch you all soon. Take care. Thank you.